Thanks, Sean, and all the organizers for having me out here today from Los Angeles. Uh, also, thanks to the uh, Center for Inquiry, my colleagues there, for sponsoring my trip here. Why don't we start out by trying to make contact with the, the spirit in this facility? Oh, great spirit of the Forum Church slash theater, please give us a sign that you are here. Welcome to my world, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Every time I show up, the ghost is not there. Um, I try to keep my attitude right. I try to um, be, have an open mind, but they never seem to show up. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few different things today. Um, first of all, I guess we should establish, is there a problem out there with all these paranormal beliefs? And by the way, this is kind of mixed between paranormal and religion today. Um, I don't really distinguish if there's anything that's supernatural and beyond um, scientific observations. It's all in the same category to me. I think these two things feed each other. If you have religious beliefs, you have more likely to have paranormal beliefs and vice versa. So um, we should establish if there's a problem at all. I would say yes, there absolutely is. If you watch TV, you see um, you know groups of people running around dark buildings with all kinds of gear trying to find ghosts. You find uh, all Larry and Curly doing uh, psychic readings on TV. I've been to I actually wrote an article for Skeptical Inquirer about uh, James Van Prague and John Edward. Um, and I've been in the audience for both of those shows, and they are spectacularly average in their cold reading skills. Um, there's nothing like a good editor to help you along for making it look like you're doing uh, a little bit better. And they're almost day, but I don't think it's what the hell they do. Um, you got guys running around in gorilla suits and starting giant cottage industries in the Pacific Northwest. You have dowsers all over the United States uh, being paid to pay good money in some cases to uh, find water that is clearly, obviously, under the ground, no matter what they do. And uh, you have people um, believing in UFO photos and sometimes faking them. Um, that's a faked UFO photo that I shot in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, just a few weeks ago. Um, but there's MUFON and huge groups of believers in the in uh, UFOs as well. You probably have some sense of this. This is a, this poll is a little bit older, but you get the idea. I mean, a, a quarter of adults in this country believe in astrology, uh, telepathy, ghosts, ESP. Almost fifty percent of the people believe in ESP. That's over a hundred million people in this country. ESP. And I would say that the evidence against ESP is overwhelming. Uh, but apparently, 100 million people don't believe that or don't want to believe that. So, um, I think that's a problem. Why is this a problem? A lot of people would say, so what? This doesn't do any harm, or who cares if, if people believe these things? Um, first of all, I'd say, we're spending billions of dollars on all this stuff. There's a lot of different better ways to spend uh, a billion dollars than uh, through a lot of this stuff. And some of it ends up being spent through your tax dollars and the government. Um, a belief in a wrong thing becomes an obstacle to the truth. For instance, if you have a serious belief that alien creatures were visiting this planet and were thinking about taking us over and you wanted to allocate some budgetary money, money for that, it, it might be a problem. Um, or if you believed in certain conspiracy theories about 9-11 and wanted to focus our homeland security on that version, uh, you may be taking away resources from uh, the real, more likely problem. Those examples go on and on. Um, in, in the case of health, if you're using an alternative medicine in place of a scientific medicine, and I, I never 
say Western medicine, I always say scientific medicine. Scientific medicine is the same in all places in the world. It's not the West. It's science versus non-science. Um, if you're taking, we're going to be hearing about homeopathy later, in place of your cancer drug, you're going to be in big trouble. The stakes are high. I once, does anybody recognize that guy? That's Benny Hinn. He's a, uh, he's a televangelist slash uh, faith healer. Um, I've been to his concerts a few times, and I say concerts because they're shows. They're very well orchestrated productions. I've been to Benny Hinn's uh, a, a few times, and uh, one time I was backstage, and, uh, and I met a guy, and I said, why are you here? And he said, well, I have, this, I have a bad heart. I have a heart condition. I was hoping, hoping the Reverend would be able to help me out. And I said, well, what have you done for it so far? And he said, well, I've been to an astrologer, a tarot card reader, and two faith healers. And I said, do you ever think about going to a cardiologist to check that out? Uh, it didn't really come up on his, on his radar. Uh, that is a life-threatening attitude for this man. In the abstract, lower, it lowers standards, these, these beliefs lower standards society-wide for critical thinking. It is in our individual and collective interest to be able to criti uh, think critically about all sorts of different issues. Um, we have to be able to distinguish between the truth and fiction um, because all ideas are not equal. Okay, so what do we do about this? Uh, I'm a big believer in action in this case. Um, it's, it's one thing just to sort of sit around with your arms crossed and, and, and be angry and, and say that this is all BS, but I think there are steps we can take. I'm a big believer in testing claims. A lot of these claims are very testable. We can uh, create a protocol and show the world whether this thing works or not. Now, I should be careful not to beg the question, not all claims are testable. The, the uh, example I most often hear is people say, well, you can't prove that God doesn't exist. And I say, you're right, I can. I can't prove that lots of things don't exist. Um, I can't prove Santa Claus doesn't exist, by the way. Do you believe in Santa Claus? Usually they don't. Um, <laughs> So I say, uh, just as an example, how would you test, how would you prove Santa Claus doesn't exist? I mean, it sounds like a ridiculous proposition, but if you really wanted to test that and prove that, how would you prove that? Well, he lives at the North Pole. It's a big place, thousands and thousands of square miles. If you wanted to search for his lair, um, you would have to get an expedition together and figure out a way to maybe do a flyover, maybe you have some scanning radar, maybe you have a ground expedition. That's really tough because that's some rough ice out there. Um, you, you really, for all intents and purposes, would not be able to even conduct a search. And even if you did, you know, it's, it's, it's hidden, right? I mean, he's got special power. So um, just by the definition of who Santa Claus is and the reality of figuring out a way to prove that and come up with evidence is, uh, it would be impossible. So the onus of proof is always on the person making the assertion. But we can test a lot of claims. And I say, test the claims. And this isn't just people like me who have investigations groups and you know big organizations behind us. You people can do this stuff too, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you a little insight about you know how we go about testing some of this stuff, and um, you know you can take some of this home with you and uh, point it at the people making these claims. I'll go over three examples. Um, the other thing we can do is spread the word to other people. There are things you're going to learn here today. There are things you already know. Um, some of you people already consider yourself skeptics and, and read this stuff and know lots about this, but spread the word. Don't just keep it quiet. Uh, talk to your friends 
and relatives about this stuff. Um, the information outlets are an important aspect of this because they're the ones who spread some of the misinformation continuously. Those shows I showed you before, the local news, the local newspaper, the magazines, all those things. So uh, you need to make yourselves heard by those outlets. And then personally, just uh, yourself, be somewhat of an ambassador about this. It, it's easy to get frustrated with this stuff, but um, uh, I'll talk just a little bit about uh, just sort of how to act and position yourself you know, when having these discussions. So um, I'm going to talk about three different claims. Um, let's start out with a ghost hunt because I figured you know, we're in ghost central here. Um, rule number one is show up. It sounds obvious, but um, you can't sit somewhere else and just say ghosts are BS and uh, there's no way it was there. You gotta go to the place and, and poke around and you don't have to have EMF meters and forward-looking infrared and all this stuff. Who says what a ghost is made of? Does a ghost register on a, does a ghost have a magnetic field? Is there anyone who can say that categorically? Well then why are you showing up with an EMF meter? Why are you taking the temperature of the room if there's a cold spot here and there? Ladies and gentlemen, every building in the United States has a cold spot in it. There are, there are spots that are warmer and colder in every building everywhere. It doesn't mean anything. So show up. Uh, turn the lights on, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you're running around in the dark. You don't need infrared if you turn as a switch right over here. <laughs> As for eyewitness accounts, I, I had an example of this this morning. A nice lady at the concession over here, I, I asked her about the, the ghost in the building, and um, she works here at least occasionally and has not seen it. Okay, so who's the person who saw it? Can I talk to that person? You talk to that guy. Well, I didn't actually see it, but I, my friend saw it, and you know, by the time it, it ends up that nobody saw it, or you know, that it was somebody's grandfather who saw it, and he's dead now. So, um, as for the actual person who talked to it, and by the way, even after you get to that person, eyewitnesses make bad eyewitnesses. People make mistakes about what they see all the time. Just go, go sit in court someday. You know, multiple people who saw the exact same incident, they're all trying to tell the truth, and they're all telling different <coughs> stories. What's the problem here? Well, the problem is our perception is not clear. It's not all the same. Our memory is not clear and all the same. There are all kinds of problems with eyewitness accounts. So even when you get to it, it not, may not be good most reliable thing. If there are two witnesses, separate the witnesses when they're talking about it. We had a case in uh, Hollywood Hills, two uh, screenwriters, a husband and wife, lived together and they woke up one night and they saw the same ghost at the end of the bed. That was kind of interesting. Usually people who are dreaming don't have the exact same dream. So we went out there and talked to them, but the first thing we did was separate them, and we had cameras on each one of them as we were interviewing them about the ghost. And then we you know, switched and came back, and later on we found out that they actually weren't quite talking about the same ghost. They were talking about two different ghosts, even though when they sat there together, they kind of riffed off each other's story, and they, they, it, it, it sort of sounded like it was the same ghost, but it wasn't. Um, see if there's any other explanation for whatever happened. If something fell down, if something moved, if there are sounds in the attic, uh, what other explanations might there be? Um, here's a picture of a ghost. I'll kind of make it bigger. Uh, there's a ghost sitting on the end of the bed. I don't know if you can see it, but um, you know, I mean, of course, they have a suspicious mind that I do. I think that this might be either an accidental double exposure or an out and out fake. This looks like an older picture. But just to give you a clue about how my mind works with something like that, I'm, I'm looking to see if 
is the, is the spot pushed down on the bed right underneath the ghost's ass? I mean, is it consistent with reality there? Um, is the light hitting the face of the ghost? There's a little circle down in the corner. Is the light hitting the ghost consistent with the light in the room? Sometimes you, you see that uh, that people don't, don't, when they're photoshopping things in, uh, they don't think of little tiny details like that. Um, is the size of the ghost consistent with what, I mean, these look like kids in these beds. Is the size of the ghost at the end there consistent with the kid? When you look at it from here, it sort of looks right, but if you would uh, expand the size of that ghost to the size of the bed, it looks just on first glance like that kid would be about 6'6". Six, six. So um, just little things like that, is it, is it consistent? Um, so test any other explanations that you can do. Um, ask lots of questions. You never know what question might be the answer to your ghost problem. Like for instance, one of the first questions we always ask is we went to a family haunting in Fullerton, California once. And we said, are there any nine-year-olds in the house? Because nine-year-olds turn out to be lots of the ghosts. <laughs> 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 you find out, you know, there's a penny flies across the room or something, and uh, turns out to be a kid. Uh, and is your attic sealed? Uh, the number of squirrel slash possum ghosts turns out to be uh, pretty high out there. Uh, we went to, uh, there was a, an actress in West Hollywood who just moved into an apartment, and she, right after moving in, she had these weird, incidents is happening. Um, and the first of which was, and the scariest for her, was she found in her kitchen a little pool of an unknown substance. It was a liquid substance in the middle of her kitchen. Now, there was nothing obviously leaking from the sinks. There was nothing leaking from the top. And she was like, what is this? How, did it, how could it possibly have gotten there? So we just showed up. We took a look around. Um, and saw where it was, and it wasn't until we got sort of down on ground level that we saw this little trail leading away from the pool, because there wasn't a trail, there wasn't a river leading to the lake, it was just a little lake in the middle of the room. But if you got down close, you could see a little some mineral deposits from the evaporated water um, leading to the pool. And we traced it to the back of the refrigerator where the coil was freezing up, uh, getting a bunch of frost on it, and as it cycled through, the coil melted and then produced this river and the lake. The river dries up, the lake remains, and the woman is out of her mind with fear. <laughs> so um, that was a great one because we actually showed up and we solved all three mysteries in about 20 minutes. We measured some stuff and, and found exactly what was going on. Um, telepaths, I love testing telepaths because it's, it's one of these sort of solid yes or no things. I mean, a lot of times we get claims, again, in the untestable area where people will say something like, I just know wh which elevator door is going gonna, is gonna to open up. And we say, okay, let's go to an elevator bank and um, we're going to put earmuffs on you so you can't hear it and do some other. No, it doesn't happen all the time. It just happens once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's not a claim. We can't test it. Uh, telepaths are very testable. Um, it usually just become, it becomes an issue of odds when they're trying to uh, send a certain message to someone else. It becomes a, a, a simple matter of mathematical probability. Um, so we have the, the people show up, and by the way, a lot of times they ask us, okay, I, I send these thoughts out and everybody can hear them. And we say, okay, um, we're not interested about everybody hearing them, we're just interested in one singular, single person hearing them. And we're not gonna supply that person. You have to find someone who's had some, you've had some success with and bring that person because we're not going to be involved in the test. 
if for no other reason than we don't want to get to the end of the test, you fail and then you say, well, you sabotaged it. You were actually hearing the right answer, but you wouldn't do it because you're a bunch of skeptics and negative energy. Um, so they have to bring their own person. So we have to, we separate scan and seal, which is we separate the center of the receiver, um, preferably in separate rooms, preferably as far away from each other as possible. Um, we scan them for transmitting devices. We have one of those metal detector airport scanners and I make people take their shoes off. We poke around in their mouth a little bit. We look for earbuds. We do the whole thing, We're very suspicious because the whole thing depends on the transmission of information. So we seal off any way that we can think of, every way we can think of, to get that information from one place to another. Close the windows and doors, uh, lights, even so little things that you might not think of. We try to brainstorm and come up with as many of those possible cheats as possible. One of them, incidentally, and I learned this from a mentalist, is time sequence. If you have only a few possible answers to a question, like with the Zener cards, you know the star, the circle, the plus, the wavy lines, there are only five of those Zener cards. Um, you can transmit which Zener card it is just by how long you take to answer the question. If you and the receiver are mentally counting in between guesses, the speed at which you answer can give the, give the question away. So we have to sort of know uh, as many of those things as possible. Uh, everybody is double-blinded. Nobody knows what the next card is going to be. Not the person, not the testers, not anyone. And I always spot check after the first few trials because if they're scoring off the charts, and off the probability charts early on, it's like either they're extremely lucky or something's going on, they're cheating, and we have to huddle real quick and make sure that something funny is going on. Uh, that's a guy named Reagan Trainer who uh, took a bus from Seattle, Washington to Los Angeles. Um, showed, he's a telepath. He showed up with his friend, drunk off their asses. Um, he insisted on taking his shirt off before beginning. Uh, <laughs> really, I got kind of surreal for a minute. I was wondering <laughs> what the heck is going on here. Uh, one unusual thing about him was he wanted a monitor uh, to be in place so that he could watch his buddy in the other room. Uh, and we had to sit down and think about that, you know, which way the information was going. And we thought that since he's doing the sending, um, it doesn't matter if he sees what's going on in the other room. Um, he. I was flipping cards over one at a time, playing cards, a stack of 52 playing cards. Um, and he said he could get 45 of them, I think. I forgot what the 45 out of 50, which is in the gazillions to one uh, probability of being able to do that. It's, it, was a, it was about 50-50 that he would guess one right out of 52. Actually, it would have been a 100%, if you would just guessed the same card every time, you would have gotten one right. Uh, and he got zero right out of 52. <laughs> That's a long bus ride back to Seattle. <laughs> uh, we were also worried about him because we thought, why is this guy taking a bus? It's not really much cheaper than, than taking uh, an airplane down. So we were a little worried that you know, maybe he would show up with a you know, weapon or some other plane. Very paranoid about these people. Uh, there's uh, Acha Nguyen from Hawaii, another telepath who flew in. He had a, a massive preparation process. He had to do push ups before uh, being able to send his <clears throat> information. And uh, he drank a bunch of Red Bull and threw cold water on his face. This is preparation. It's not for us to decide what they need to do to get into the state of mind or whatever it is. My attitude is 
go to town, you know, uh, make yourself happy, do whatever you have to do to give yourself the best shot, as long as it's not interfering um, with the protocol. Um, our job was, our protocol was to, that we would put simple words on cards and he would transmit the words to his friend. Um, I don't know if he, this, this odds of this, because he had to do 18 out of 20, I think, and that, this one was even more off the charts than the other one because um, there's something like 500,000 words in the English language, so 500,000 to one times 500,000 to one 20 times in a row. That's it's pretty remote. Uh, he got zero. Right? <laughs> Okay, dowsers. Um, you probably have do there's probably a dowser, you know, within a pretty close range of where we're sitting right now. Um, some of these people say they can find water. Some of them say they can find uh, ore or oil or various different things, and they use dowsing rods or witching sticks to do this. Um, the first thing we, we do with a, a, a dowser is make sure his powers are intact. So um, the we tested a guy who came in from Phoenix not too long ago and said he could find a gallon of water under a cardboard box. And the first thing we did was stuck a gallon of water in the middle of the room and put the cardboard box in front of him and showed him that it was under there and said, you know, take a walk over this just to make sure everything's happening. And sure enough, the dowsing rods crossed right over the water, so you want to give him a chance just to make sure his, his powers are working. He gets to pre-dowse the area to make sure there are no other sources of water there, so he clears the whole area and makes sure everything's okay, and he actually he made it, this guy made us move a little bit. I'll show you a guy uh, in a second here who we had to move the whole operation twice, but actually the area is okay. Uh, the last thing I ask before we start is, is there anything that would prevent you from being able to do this? Uh, again, assess the odds. Uh, you want to make sure nobody, including us, double blind again, uh, sees where it's going to be. I don't think I have any poker tells, but I don't want to, you know, slightly tense up if he, when he's walking by the, the box that has the water underneath it. So um, I don't know where it is. None of the investigators know where it is. Um, make some rules up, up about this. Look, you can't touch the boxes. You can't kick them. You can't peek under them. You can't you know, <laughs> do the obvious things. No instruments. Um, that was an interesting case. If somebody showed up with a, you know, more than just a bent rod, if they showed up with some gizmo, um, maybe it would throw a, a sonar or something like that that might be able to register uh, a liquid. So we would be uh, very interested that. Uh, we'll find again, spot check, same thing. Um, so with this guy who we just tested a, a, like a month ago, um, we had 15 different boxes sitting in a large room. Only one of them had a gallon of water under it. So he dials the entire 15 boxes. He said he could do three in a row. He said he could pick the one gallon of water under these boxes three times successively. Um, it's a little bit lower odds than we like for our, we have, we have a, the Independent Investigations Group has a $50,000 challenge for anyone to prove paranormal ability. And we like to do the, they have to sort of do it twice. And the first time, which we call the preliminary challenge, we, we like to have the odds about something like 5,000 to 1. Um, this was 33.75 to 1 to pick it out of the street there. And he pre doused the area and said it was contaminated. So we went out into the parking lot and he pre doused the area and said it was contaminated. So now here we're on the, on the parkway here in the grass. And we just put a piece of copper wire, this was a little bit harder to quantify in terms of odds. We just put a copper wire underneath a thick rug, a thin copper wire over a thick rug on the grass. And he just dials back and forth over the um, carpet and then laid a piece of string exactly over where he thought the copper wire was. 
flipped the um, carpet over, and he went 0 for 5 and then quit. So the Dowsers and Randy, James Randy's tested Dowsers, the Dowsers for, and these guys think there's something scientific to, to it. Um, a lot of them aren't the hardcore paranormal believers that some of these other claims are. And they really, um, they're, they're very convinced that there's something real happening there and they've, they've just all failed. Um, there are some little micro tests you could do if, you know, maybe you're not, you know, you don't have an investigations group or you're just walking down the street. I took a break from my office in Hollywood and I went for a walk and I walked by the psychic place. I didn't even realize what was going on. The, the guy was outside and he said, come on in for a reading, come on in for a reading. And I said, well, I don't believe in that sort of thing. And he said, um, come on, give it a try, give it a try. And I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 20 bucks if you can tell me what, what birth, where was my birthday. And he said, well, you're a Leo. And I said, I didn't say what sign. I said, what, what is my birthday? And he said, well, um, I'm getting November. And I just walked away. I think it tortures them a little bit. <laughs> um, because it's like, you know, you hold the money out and it's like, right here and now, test your powers. Do a psychic medium have one sort of specific thing? And remember the mediums all deal in generalities usually. Either they deal in generalities and, you know, it's an M, and an M or a J name, or they, you know, they're guessing for an M or a J name, or they're guessing sp specific things, but they're making lots and lots of guesses. Um, just asking some simple specific question, where did my grandfather die, or, you know, something that would be beyond a simple guess. If you're speaking to my grandfather's spirit, you would think he would know where he died. Uh, remote viewers, I love this one. We went to a class once where they were teaching remote viewing. It was a $50 class which led to an $1,100 seminar which they were pitching at the class. And I just put, I put a card with a word on top of my car in the parking lot, and I got up at the end of the class and I said, I got, I got a check for $5,000 right now if you can just tell me what the word is on top of the car. Project yourself out of the classroom right now, and I'll give you $5,000 right now. What did they say to that? They accuse us of being skeptics and having negative energy, uh, but they still leave without $5,000. And everyone else in the class wonders, why didn't you take him up on and take his money? Actually, we had people saying that to them, too. Yeah, prove him wrong, prove him wrong. <laughs> uh, to the spoon bender, uh, we went to a spoon bending class, too. Um, we said, can you do it with my spoon? I brought a spoon that was, like, really tough. <laughs> they couldn't do it. Um, and I, I also like to say, you know, you say you can bend spoons with your mind. Why are you touching it? Why are you rubbing it? Hold it out on the end and bend it with your mind. Um, by the way, I, I, I've been doing a TV series, believe it or not, in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, this psychic show, and I'm a judge on the psychic show trying to introduce as much skepticism as possible into the show. It's all done in Russian. Um, geez, I hope they're translating me right. <laughs> uh, the other judge on the show is Uri Geller. You guys know that? Ah. Spoonbender from, from the uh, 70s. Got so in a big fight with him on that show. <laughs> okay, so you see that these things can be tested. Um, now let's, let's spread the word to the masses. Um, learn some of these explanations, and I know so many people are good with this already, but there are, the information is out there with almost all of this stuff. It's easy to find out what really happened at Roswell, um, some of the Bigfoot stories, how psychics work and cold reading works, um, the, the physicians filming the Loch Ness Monster. I mean, there's sort of, in the hardcore skeptic community, these things are old news, most of the people in the world don't know the actual explanations, though. And there are lots of 
different resources to find out this information. Um, of course, I think highly of Skeptical Inquirer magazine. It's been around for 35 years now. Um, but there are other, you know, Snopes.com, Quack Watch, um, Phil Plater, you're going to see later, has a great, great website, Bad Astronomy. Um, the information is out there. So, anytime you see one of these things that interests you a little bit, find out the real explanation and talk about it. When someone brings that up, talk about, by the way, you know, what the real story is there. And be excited about the real explanation. Just because it's the scientific, reason, logic-driven explanation doesn't mean it's boring. The story of the Roswell thing is kind of interesting. The story of the Phoenix Lights, two separate incidences of UFOs in the same night, um, is kind of interesting. And it's, it's understandable why people looked up and said, what the heck is that? The, the, the explanation, lots of times, is not obvious at all. It, it takes uh, a little looking into it and trying to figure it out. So find out those things and, and be a little conversant with it. Now, the information outlets, this is where, especially where, you know, we who sort of do this professionally need your help because I can call up Oprah all day long and, and she'll like, okay, I'm sick of talking to this crank. But if a thousand people called the Oprah show or would have when it was on, uh, that makes a little difference. Or if you write a letter to the editor to your newspaper, if your newspaper gives a totally uh, gullible, believer-driven version of a story, write a letter and say, come on, this is old hen. Be in it. Be an investigator and call them up and say, you know, again, you don't have to shout at them, but you can say, you know, you guys really missed this. Same thing with the local news at night. I mean, the Fox News Channel by us is terrible when it comes to this stuff. But, you know, every once in a while, we, we try to get people to call them up and just give them a little brief, you know. Talk to the person who write it. Talk to the segment producer. It doesn't hurt them to get the balanced side of the, of the story. It might be interesting, too. It's not going to kill their ratings. And then write to them call specific shows and the network that airs those shows. Because So not only the production of the show, but the network. And I have a task for you people to do. I just did the Dr. Phil show this week. I don't know when it's going to air yet, but keep an eye out for it. They had a bunch of psychic, psychics on it. I was told that Dr. Phil was a hardcore skeptic. He was on my side. A producer actually said, Phil's probably a, hard, a bigger skeptic than you are. <laughs> I don't think so. I got on there and I had, I'm going to wait till they air because I'm going to put the stopwatch on this. I want to know what percentage of the time I had. I don't need, I don't, it doesn't have to be, there were like 10 people speaking in favor of psychic powers and me on the other side. And I don't need 10 people with me, I just need roughly 50% of the time to answer everything they're doing. I don't think I got anywhere near 10% of the time. So when this episode airs, um, please call Dr. Phil. And lastly, uh, being an ambassador, and this is tough because I know people are frustrated and they're angry at some of this stuff, and this also applies to some of the, you know, the religious issues as well. You get very frustrated and you get angry and it's hard to have a sane conversation, especially with someone who may not know as much as you do about the subject. But um, when you're having the discussion, try to let go of the anger, at least don't be outwardly angry. People. Um, a, a lot of people just really don't know um, what the true story is on, on these cases. So you, can, you can't completely blame them for not knowing because, as I just said, the media makes it look like a lot of this stuff is true. I mean, what these psychics are doing, there was a woman at, at the Dr. Phil show who said, um, she said the words that I've heard probably hundreds of times. 
There's no way she could have known that. Yeah, there is a way she could have known that. First of all, she probably didn't know that. You probably told her and didn't realize you told her. If I would went back on the tape of every single psychic reading that happened to the people who spoke on the show, I can say, here's what they're doing. They're throwing on a wide net. You said yes to this, so that narrowed the category. Then they went in, they threw a bunch of guesses out. Nine out of 10 of them were wrong, but then they hit on this thing and you were amazed. That's what happened. They didn't know that thing from the beginning, if they knew it from the beginning, they would walk up to someone in a crowd and say, your grandfather's name is Henry. He, he uh, died in Wichita in uh, 1947 of a heart attack, and he was sitting on a tractor when it happened. Does that ever happen in a psychic reading? Never. But most people don't realize how they get to that. You might get to that same conclusion, but through other means, through techniques and cold reading. So don't blame people for not knowing how this stuff works. And it's, it's tough, especially after you know about it and you get frustrated with people not knowing. Um, choose your wording on how you talk to people. And I have to constantly think about this stuff. Um, I, I try to use questions like, what would it take to convince you? I mean, what would change your mind about something like this? And ask this to religious people, too. What would it change, take to change your mind about the divinity of Jesus or that the existence of God? What would it take to change your mind? Nothing. There's no way. As I have it in my heart, nothing would change my mind. What does that make you? It makes you close minded. What do they accuse us of? Being closed minded. Wait a second. No, I, I'll, I will believe that Jesus walked on water. I'll believe that James Van Prague can. Talk to dead people. I'll believe any of this stuff. Just give me some good evidence. I, I, I'm open. I don't think it's going to happen. But if you show me some fantastic evidence, I'll believe anything. I'll believe anything that has good evidence. Even things I hope that I don't want to believe. I don't want to believe the Bears are going to be last this year in the NFL season. <laughs> If we get to December and they're at 1 in 15, I can't believe it. It's overwhelming evidence. Now, if you're talking about something like the Cubs winning the World Series, well, you're know, talking about impossibilities. Aww. Um, this is another nice one. Have you ever considered the possibility that there may be another explanation for Roswell, New Mexico? That, sometimes I gets people and catches them off guard a little bit. Have you ever considered the possibility that there may be another explanation? That you may not know everything about this particular subject, or that you may not know everything in the world? That's an old fallacy of logic, right? That, that if I can't conceive of it being any other way, then it can't be so. That's an argument from ignorance. If I can't figure it out, it can't be figured out. That's a massive ego at work. So those little things, I think, uh, <clears throat> in your dealings with people can help just sort of uh, how, how to approach things and, and not sound so didactic or dogmatic or sure. And finally, and maybe some of the science people would not like to see this, but and part of the reason we started the Independent Investigations Group was because it provides great anecdotal evidence, as well as hard evidence. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to do as tight of science as we can possibly do. It's not always perfect, but we try to, we try to keep it as tight as possible. But that's when it's happening. Two weeks later, at dinner or at Thanksgiving, I'm talking about the guy who pulled his shirt off, and he had suction cup marks, by the way, on his chest. I, I have no idea where they came from. But that's part of the story. That's part of, you know, we can tell the story about, you know, these guys showing up drunk, and, you know, when we went to the haunted house, when we did this and that, and it was, that was weird and amazing and fun and cool, and because their side lives 
on the storytelling. They are successful because the stories are fun and interesting. Our side can be more successful too if we have stories to tell that are also based in good science and good critical thinking. So um, if you poke into some of these issues every now and then or conduct experiments or get some good information and learn about this stuff, become a storyteller as well. It, it really uh, it appeals to people and I think it helps our cause. So I will ask you people to speak out. That is a T-Rex from the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Um, which, I mean, that, that makes my last point for me, by the way. They spent 30 million bucks on this museum. That's a pretty cool looking T-Rex in there. And you know kids are walking through there. Uh, you know, and by the way, there's a human being right next to the T-Rex, which that's a little bit off a few, few million years, few tens of millions of years. Um, but they're smart because they know that a little kid is going to walk through there and look at the T-Rex and at some level say, wow, that's cool and it's going to stick with me. So they understand uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, the, the, the drama of it, the theater of it. Um, but Everybody here needs to to speak out and uh, help along with this cause because we're outnumbered and uh, we need all the help we can get. Thank you.
drops by small towns in Kentucky and anally probes people. <laughs> um, that seems to be a little less likely. <laughs> um, I, in fact, I brought my, uh, I'm about to release a UFO kit, and, and I fake UFO photos wherever I, I've been, so you'll, you'll see UFOs hopefully uh, over Wichita in the near future. <laughs> So I think there are prosaic explanations for virtually all UFO sightings and the belief in those kinds of UFOs. And, and by the way, let's remember that UFO is simply unidentified. There's lots of stuff up there that we look up and see, uh, and, they, and we can't quite put a finger on it. Um, just between airplanes and experimental aircraft and weather phenomena, there are you can't always look up in the sky and know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, to make that inferential leap that, that that is a spaceship with aliens on it from another planet is too big a leap and that a leap that I don't think supported by the aliens. Yeah. yeah.